Um, when I was a youngster and not yet sure what I wanted to do for a living, uh, a wise man said to me in the pub, find something you really enjoy doing, and then get someone to pay you to do it. Sage advice which I dutifully, dutifully followed down many a career cul-de-sac before I came to archaeology, some of which were even legal. Now, what he didn't say to me was, create a massive problem for someone and then get them to pay you to take it away. But I think, kind of ironically, that's what I've ended up doing in my career as a commercial sector archaeologist. Archaeology has grown into a commercial industry embedded with environmental risk management, which has had real bonuses for the professionalisation of our industry. Um, but I think it's come at the cost of our connection with the wider public. Today's presentation by us, and I think the session in general, is about how we can address this issue, how we can reposition what we do as archaeologists to reconnect with that wellspring of public interest. I'm going to talk about some of our thinking around community archaeology, why we think that community archaeology represents uh, a massive mission drift for most organisations, and some of the criticism that we come under for taking an innovative approach to community archaeology, because it, it shines a spotlight on our thinking around community archaeology or self-limiting beliefs about what we might be able to achieve with it. So who are we? We're Dick Ventures. We're the first community, exclusively community-focused, registered organisation in the Institute. We're hoping there'll be some more coming through soon enough. We describe ourselves as social entrepreneurs. That is, we use creative thinking to um, develop tools and approaches to address social problems. That's all well and good, just as long as we start out with the, with the right problem. Um, in archaeology, that's not so difficult. It's widely acknowledged that we're in the midst of a crisis. I've had this slide for about five years now, and I continue to update it. You might call it the same crisis, different day. Today, the biggest issue is the cut in local authority budgets, the loss of planning and archaeological roles, conservation roles. It's something Jane Greenville recently commented in February this year, CBA, uh, Chair of the CBA Trustees, she said that the provision of county-wide archaeological services, something that was set in place in the 70s and 80s, may well turn out to be a generational phenomenon. It may well be all over. Now that sounds alarming and alarmist, but there are certain parts of the UK, particularly the North and the Midlands, where this is actually looking like the case. So it's all pretty bad. But, in true motivational speaker style, I'd like to show you this slide and this quote from JFK. When written in Chinese, the word crisis is composed of two characters. One represents danger, the other represents opportunity, or something Homer Simpson likes to call crisitunity. <laughs> so, what is the crisitunity? Well, here we have our stats. There are all kinds of ways to measure what we all known as fact, that there's a massive public interest. And this represents a latent potential of advocates who may yet will save us from the axe-man's blade. The question is, how do we mobilise it? Now, the South Point Group presented an ambitious vision for a revival of public participation in archaeology, arguing for a network of staff resource centres linked to local authority HERs, around which the public and professionals alike can coalesce to explore and research the past, or you might call it community archaeology. Now the big question is, if there's a broad consensus for doing this, why hasn't it been done? We've been in the midst of this crisis for a good while now. And we think that, um, you know, the clues to this actually lies in, in the appendix of the Southport Group's report, um, which was an economic analysis of the archaeology market by the London School of Economics. They took a, an economic view of that, the entire archaeology market to understand how we might broaden the contribution um, to society, archaeological work. And they took a focus on the total economic value of archaeology, because cultural heritage assets fall under the category of public goods. The total economic value can be defined as a combination of use value, option value, and existence value. 
Therefore, the public benefit of an investigation can be measured as a combination of all three. So this is what it looks like when we put it out visually, and that's what it looks like when we layer on the different silos that we all find ourselves working in. And the trouble is that our procurement models, the way we pay for our archaeological work, the way we deliver it, the people we're beholden to for our money, are kind of dragging us out of that, that sweet spot, that middle ground, where we all want to be, and our true public benefit. Now there's lots of rhetoric around what each of us does, wherever we happen to be sat, but I think the way to cut through this is to ask, what's the quickest way of the career ladder in each of these sectors? And the commercial sector would be profitably servicing our clients and taking them through planning with the least level of hassle. In the academic sector, it would be landing and delivering research grants and producing research publications um, that, that hit the REF assessment. In the community sector, it's not really a sector quite yet. It's kind of being serviced by other people. But in terms of the outcomes that people like the HLF require, they, can, they still underrepresent perhaps the research value and the other values that, that we, we'd like to see. It's all about people, it's all about communities. Now just in their own terms, people undertaking work in all of these different areas are doing very good archaeological work. But taking a wider assessment of the total economic value of archaeology, these fall short. Now this is what we talk about when we say that generalised commitments to outreach and education um, are no substitute for the rigour of an enterprise defining their contribution to society with their core revenue generating activities. The medium is quite literally the message. Once we worked this out, what we really needed to do was stop ourselves being pulled away from that centre ground, that public benefit area. We needed a new procurement model, and that's why we hit upon crowdfunding and crowdsourcing. Now, by this stage I'm sure many of you are aware of crowdfunding and what it is. Uh, we're a crowdfunding platform, we're one of 650 globally. We're focused exclusively on archaeology, archaeology and heritage, and we're a reward-based crowdfunding um, uh, platform. We combine this with crowdsourcing, in effect um, putting people on site. So crowdfunding would be collecting small amounts of money from large amounts of individuals. Crowdsourcing is a way to um, put those people on site. It's a way of bringing labour into what it is that you do. I've been very successful at this. Over the last two years we've raised about £65,000 for um, two sites. We're in a second season at Leyston Abbey. We were 49% funded on that. That money has gone on to leverage um, three times that for our project partners. The site of Lace and Abbey is a good example of our model. We're raising £18,000 as seed funding. Um, the HLF are, are match funding that to the tune of £75,000, creating £100,000 of project. So what we're doing is create, using crowdfunding as seed capital, which then goes on to, to bring other funders to plug into the projects. What this looks like when we deliver it on site, well here are some of the top line stats. We, uh, bring, we brought over 250 people funded us, we've got various digital stats. Oops. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'll just rush through these now. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did this bit out of the I'll talk about that. Oh. you just especially carry on talk and I'll go see No problem, so I'll talk from there. So, oops. Okay, so the stats are 
they speak for themselves. And this is year on year uh, um, uh, visitor numbers. The spikes are above our campaign running into the campaign. Quite fair, the lives of the campaign quite fair. And you can see this, you can see how it brings activity. I'll put an archaeology on this side, it brings all the activity. And um, 2,000 visitors to Five Brand, 29% increase. Okay, quickly. Uh, 29% increase, 60% had never been before. Yeah. Always. Um, okay, quick further for, for on there, that's fine. Um, Les and Nobby, different kind of sites. It wasn't a, a nationally involved Black Fed, but you can see the kind of numbers we're getting are very similar. And we expect that model to continue to keep going. Um, again, uh, similar kind of numbers, just a slightly smaller stature. We're on site just for two weeks this time. Okay, okay so um, what's interesting, I think, uh, you know, this, this should all be great, shouldn't it? You know, we've, we've, we've raised all this money, we've brought all these people on site. Um, but what's interesting was the kind of um, response that we got. Um, it's fair to say that the majority of the criticism that we got came from people who were embedded in the public archaeology uh, sphere, and the focus was placed very much on the money that we were making and how exclusionary we were being. And we got lots of positive support as well, but I want to single these things out because it really does shine the spotlight on what we think of community archaeology. Um, if you look on some of the Twitter feeds or some of the blogs that were written about us at the time, we find colleagues openly um, discuss and uh, question our credentials, our abilities, our morals, um, hold our website up to ridicule, accuse us of profiteering, um, question whether or not we were real archaeologists. Um, can we move that forward? Great stuff. Good stuff. If you click through a couple of these, you can see what the kind of stuff we got to keep going. To see your name. Who is that right thinking individual there? Yeah, let's wait and see exactly. And we've got a lot of support when we look at that kind of thing. Now, um, I think part of our criticism more specifically rounded on three aspects. The first was the book called The Big Society Angle, the second, the digital barrier issue, and the third, the anthological authority issue. Now, the big society, you can go back one, so, the big society, with the neoliberal transformation of the public sector and the ongoing economic crisis, has led to reductions in funding for cultural institutions and scientific research globally with serious impacts for archaeology. Now, the big society was, of course, the Tory poster boy for this, which kind of sought to genuinely, um, sort of exploit genuine fellow feeling and turn it into a kind of unstable amalgam of philanthropy, um, which would kind of take care of where state provision would leave off. Um, and I think we kind of got lumbered with that. What, what was uh, it's a climate of fear, and within that fear, there's a lot of suspicion for innovation. And crowdfunding was really seen as, kind of, by some of our critics, that would perform a fig leaf effect for some quite um, uh, uh, malicious. Uh, motivations. Now to counter this, I kind of look at the way crowdfunding is being used in other sectors adjacent to ours. It's used by people like the Occupy movement, it's used by fringe um, artists, um, by people whose um, productions and ideas wouldn't be funded through traditional finance, but they're still able to get lift off for their ideas. Now this is the internet doing what the internet does best. It's working as a disintermediary it's cutting out the middleman and it's undermining traditional distribution channels. Can we go forward? A secondary issue is the digital barrier issue. Well, the critique that we received over this kind of um, focused on the way digital participation um, creates its own barrier to participation. It's argued that 90% of people consume the web, 9% comment on it, and only 1% actually actively contribute to it. So therefore, how meaningful can our digital model be, and um, by extension, how sustainable? Well, we'd argue that social media and, and the web in general has given us a capacity to bring people together as never before. 
On that basis, we, we say that the money that we uh, have raised through uh, crowdfunding is actually secondary to its primary purpose, which is to build a, a community of advocates around our sites and around our projects. Um, from one minute a day to ten minutes a day to begin with the bus for a day, a weekend, a week or longer. Um, it means that people can kind of move up the scale and then kind of move back down <coughs> in future years as, as they get more demands on the time or what have you. The point is that we keep those people, we keep growing that tribe of people who support our, our, our project over the longer term. We're in effect building online audiences for offline experiences. Um, now that's all well and good, but um, there are some people in the community archaeology, public archaeology sphere, who would say it doesn't matter how many people we engage with because we're imposing our ideas on them. And there are four effective uh, models of community of public archaeology um, that have been identified uh, the educational, public relations, critical, and multivocal. Um, broadly speaking, um, we think of this as the kind of two legs bad, um, four legs good, or four legs good, two legs better, really depending on where you want to stand. Um, to us, this is a question of archaeological epistemology. It's about how we know what we know. And if we deny the primacy of the archaeological record and expect that we'll never know anything with any degree of certainty, then the only way to judge archaeology is by how engaging it is with the community, how many people we manage to engage in the community archaeology. Now this is all well and good, the dead can't talk back, but you want to move it forward? A slightly mischievous slide. Um, I imagine that um, if I was having a community, and if I was having a community, the educational model would probably survive most. Um, it's, it's an issue, really. It's it kind of denies the capacity for the archaeology rec archaeological record to be a transformative um, power in the present. Um, we think that, the, uh, aside from this, if you want to move it forward, the main issue is actually between the top-down and bottom-up application to understanding this new emerging um, collaborative and digital economy. Its uh, economic thinking is, is based on the allocation of scarce resources and the primacy of markets. But the new digital economy is characterised by abundance and activity that takes place outside of the markets. Examples would be Wikipedia or Linux or WordPress. These are tools that are provided to the community for free on the proviso that people will add to them and improve them in some way as a gift back to the community. In fact, it makes more sense to think about this new emerging economy as an ecosystem, functioning as a unit in the same way that a community of plants, animals, and microorganisms functions with their environment. This is how we've started to think about um, the way that we practice, the way that we do archaeology. We know we're feeling our way forward on this, we haven't got all the answers, we're experimenting with it. I think that this time, that's exactly what matters. <coughs> We've just received a grant from the HLF for um, a project called Digital Dictating, which is, in effect, a cloud-based recording system that allows us to record in the field um, with iPads in a way that puts that data online in real time the moment it's created in the field. This means that it's viewable pretty much to anyone, anywhere in the world, who happens to have an internet connection. Now, we currently have a couple of boxes on our standard context sheets, description, interpretation. Imagine another box that said, uh, I'm not sure, what do you think? And someone in New Zealand could perhaps be writing into that box whilst you're stood in the trench, contemplating the future. This is where technology is taking us, but it's in some way we have to liberate ourselves from the way that we're funding ourselves and thinking about things in order to get there. Now we've called up our approach social contract archaeology. That's archaeology that enters into a social contract with an unlimited constituency of funders and stakeholders. This is our business case, that's our plan for the future. Thank you very much.